Berg fathers a child at 17, 1902, with a maid in the household. She's double his age, 34. In 1911, he marries Helena Nowalski, who was the illegitimate daughter of the Emperor Franz Joseph I of Austria. Thirteen years later, he has an affair with Hanna Fuchs Robet, and you got to say that name carefully or it sounds like a sentence. And of course, that was all engineered by Alma Mahler. Uh, Hanna was Franz Werfel's uh, sister, and of course, Franz Werfel, the third wife of Alma Maria Schindler, Mahler Gropius Werfel. And Alma's daughter by Gropius grows up, second daughter, the perfect Aryan daughter, grows up Manon, and at age 18 she contracts childhood polio, and that would be in 1934. Meanwhile, Berg has written his chamber concerto for violin, piano, and 13 wind instruments, in which he is encoded in 12-tone music the names of himself and his teacher Arnold Schoenberg and fellow student Anton Weber. The next year in the lyric suite he does some sort of coding similarly with Hannah Fuchs Robetten and begins his second and final opera, this one 12-tone, very demented subject of Lulu, a prostitute who ultimately, she controls many men, but ultimately uh, gets killed by Jack the Ripper. He does not finish that work, and Helena Berg, his wife, actually prohibited anyone from finishing that over the 40 long years that she survived, Alma Mahler-like, compare, uh, you know, 50 years. <laughs> with Mahler and Alma, and a mere 40, Berg and Helena. But she forbids anyone to complete that opera. And partially it has to do with, I think there's some Hannah fuchs Robetten encoded in that one, too. But he stops work on the opera. The opera's wonderful, by the way, but can't do everything. Uh, he stops work on the opera and is commissioned to write a, a violin concerto. And at that point, his goddaughter, who is Manon Gropius, has contracted childhood polio. And he dedicates the violin concerto to her. But as he continues to work on it, there's that Mozart Requiem energy going. He starts being convinced that he's writing this kind of death memorial piece for himself. He has been bitten by some creepy crawly insect, the the, the bite becomes infected, a carbuncle, and he's really feeling at death's door. But does a great job with the violin concerto and does manage to finish it. This is a great example of how carefully 12-tone rows can be constructed. And we've mostly dealt with rows kind of wiggling amongst uh, an octave, but Berg expands his as a, con a conception of an ascending series of major and minor thirds, which yield major and minor triads, with four notes left over the top forming a fragment of a whole tone scale, as follows. That's minor triad, minor major seven. Here's a diminished triad. There's a minor triad in there somewhere. There's an augmented triad. And then at the top, If you use every one of the four note, every one, every other note towards the bottom, you get this. The open notes of a violin. I cheated by going backwards, but either Berg does too, or he sometimes he somehow justifies it with the accompaniment. And then much later in the piece, he uses that whole tone fragment at the top and has it correspond to a Bach chorale. Es ist genug. It is enough, O oh Lord. And the original sounding like this. In F major with an alteration, Fi rather than Fa, at least on the initial way up. Do, Re, Mi, Fi, Fi, So, Re, Re, Fa, Mi.
blue scales. Joplin uses them, Berg uses them. They go way back uh, to African roots, the African-American experience in the 19th century. Here's a root pentatonic blues. That would be C, E flat, F, G, B flat, C. Berg uses a variant like this. Do, re, me, and then it's either me or fe. So, la, do. We'll see that uh, Mio likes that too, or something similar. It's something similar in John Cage too. Uh, here's another very popular one: is having not only it's have your cake and eat it, not only four but raised four as do me fa fi so te do c e flat f f sharp g b flat c. Uh, cream couldn't have done without it with sunshine of your love. Do do te do so fi fa do me do. Uh, to this is often added a, a chord structure of 12 bars, all major chords. And having the, the blues, sometimes you'll get you know interesting constructions. Matter of fact, uh, we'll hear King Oliver and Louis Armstrong, uh, the opening of this, actually using a diminished seventh. And, you know, that's one of the seventh chords we really forgot about. Major seventh, dominant seventh, minor seventh. Half diminished seventh. This is the full diminished seventh. Bach used it, J.S. and Verdi and Scott Joplin used it, and you name it. Very popular chord uh, in the 19th century and into the 20th. Sometimes it reads sort of old fashioned. Anyway, uh, 12 bar blues will often be four bars on the one chord. A two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two. Then go to the four chord. A four, two measures, back to the one chord. And then on the ninth measure, you go five and a four and a one. Now, there are all sorts of variants. You can use dominant sevens on all of them. If you go slow enough, or even if you don't go that slow, Dippermouth Blues, named after Louis Armstrong, by the way, is one of his nicknames, Satchel Mouth, Dippermouth. Uh, they go to the four in the second measure, but this is a dominant seventh there. Sometimes you're going fast again, or... And, and this is true uh, here. Hang on that five chord for just two measures. There's no time to go back to four. And then another typical variant is when you get to the twelfth measure. Uh, instead of staying on the one, you might do a turnaround on five as it goes along. All right, Dipper Mouth Blues by King Oliver with Louis Armstrong as the second trumpeter. But we're hearing a, a revival recording. This is actually by Wynton Marsalis. Oh, yeah. And uh, typically in, this is New Orleans-style jazz, Dixieland-style, trad jazz, sometimes it's called. Typically, you'll have one statement of the 12-bar blues as kind of mass improvisation with, again, clarinet on the top, uh, the trumpet second, the trombone as a tenor line, and then uh, these these uh, these rhythm section uh, instruments. Then you break out for solos. We're not going to hear this, but we'll go back with a little Jelly Will Morton soon. The avant-garde even hits Hollywood by this point. Here's Herbert Stoddart with uh, excerpts from the film score to Wizard of Oz, which was done just two years after Berg's death. This would be 1939. World War II is just starting, and you're going to have some fight music, a march, two perfect fifths, a half step apart. So we got polytonality, bitonality, and into the castle with you. Got another idea to... 
Do you think it would be polite dropping in like this? Ernst's talk, Geographical Fugue, featuring Sprechstimme, continuing with one of these many German-Jewish and refugees coming to America. Many of them settle in Hollywood, like Schoenberg did. Schoenberg tried to make it in film, so did Stravinsky. Neither of them really succeeded. At one point, Schoenberg said, uh, yes, I'll have the film score ready in six months. <laughs> you don't do that. It's more like six weeks. What did he say? Three years. So this is Max Steiner. And this will show you how diverse a film composer needs to be. The opening is neo-primitive. It's kind of Stravinskyan from uh, two very short sections from King Kong, a classic old movie, one of the first talkies. Then from Gone with the Wind, and this will feature actually music concrete, uh, an overlap of uh, voices from Scarlett O'Hara's past, and then a romantic theme of... Uh, so, so, me, ray, so, so, ray, do, 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 ti, ti, la, so, me, ray, do. And finally, a little bit of, shall we say, orientalism, and that usually uh, in art and music actually refers to the Middle East rather than, shall we say, the Far East, uh, and the enthusiasm for things uh, Islamic, and that goes back obviously, to uh, at least the Crusades, and then we had the Turkish enthusiasm in Mozart and Beethoven, and Tchaikovsky and Rimsky-Korsakov evoking sounds of the Middle East. They see us. Hey, you with the camera. Come here. I want to see. Come on. Hold on. Be careful.
swing rhythms, do da do da do do do, as opposed to the straight rhythms of ragtime. We've now heard that in Different Mouth Blues. And ideally, not only mass improvisation, but solo improvisation. But just how improvised are these things? Consider the end, or towards the end, of Jelly Roll Morton's Dead Man Blues. Dead Man Blues starts with an introduction on Chopin. It's that same Pray for the Dead that we didn't hear. So we're not going to hear it here. But towards the end, you will hear in this overlay of a 12-bar blues chorus, two clarinets in parallel thirds. Well, how likely it is that this would be improvised? No, pre-planned. And so the report is, is that usually improvisation would actually, you know, from a certain group, be remarkably similar from one performance to another. Thank <laughs> you. 